Hello, all of Summon. We're back and we got some more questions. You came through with the questions. Good job. I have a list of questions that was sent in to me by you, good and glorious people. So, I am going to do my best to answer these questions and hopefully I don't get too out of track saying random crap and just going off on a tangent because I tend to go off on a tangent. So, our first questions, questionas, there's a couple of them from B. Caldrone. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Um, and if I am, I'm sorry. But by now, we already know I can't pronounce shit correctly. So, question number one is Ragnarok. Are there any signs that tell us when it is coming or did it already come at the end of the Viking Age slash the forceful takeover of Christianity? Um, the signs of Ragnarok are um, a three-year-long winter known as Fimbulwinter. And it is also said that brother will turn against brother. There will be a lot of warring. Nobody can trust each other, kind of sounds like today. Those are the main signs of Ragnarok. Then the sun and moon will be devoured and Loki will ride the ship of nails with the leading the giants and Fenrir will be unbound and the gods will face off against the giants on the Great Plain. And from that, the world will sink into the ocean to be reborn again with two humans. Now, the story of Ragnarok, especially in the, the key about the two humans surviving Ragnarok, this is going off on a tangent again. I'm not 100% sure, and I will have to do more research into this, if the, the story of the two humans surviving, because I know a lot of Christians back in the day when they were converting the Norse, used the two humans surviving as an Adam and Eve kind of thing. Like, oh, Ragnarok already happened and Adam and Eve were the, were the two that survived and now Christianity is the religion. It kind of made it easier for them to transition to that, believing that. So I don't know if that was actually a historical thing from the old religion, if there was actually like two humans that survived, or if there was details that were lost to us due to the Christianization of these stories. That's where I always get a little, hmm, it's like, was this a Christian element added into it, or is it an actual story that our ancestors used to tell? But going back to the question, that is what is heralding Ragnarok. In my opinion, Ragnarok hasn't happened yet. The scientific mind in me says that, you know, the Ragnarok that takes place and legend isn't something that is going to scientifically take place. The spiritual person in me is like, yeah, giants are gonna fight with the gods. I walk a very delicate line when it comes to this because, I mean, obviously science has come a long way since these sagas were written and since these stories were told and we know a lot more scientifically now than our ancestors did thousand years ago. So it's kind of a delicate balance because I like to take these stories as, as fact, basically, because this is the lore that we have. But then there's the scientific part of me that's like, oh, well, eventually the sun is going to supernova and, you know, there's going to be a heat death of the universe and stuff. I, I, it's a very interesting dynamic. But, I mean, it's really up to you if you want to take the stories as fact, like this is going to happen, or if you want to say this is a metaphor for something happening. I know there's a lot of people who use the old lore stories as a metaphor for something that's going to happen. Like, the event eventually the universe is going to die. Eventually the earth is going to be incinerated by the sun going into supernova, expanding into a red giant, and it's going to be eviscerated the earth will be no more. Um, will the earth eventually reform out of the particles and the and then everything? Um, I don't think the sun would be in this state to sustain new life in this solar system. I'm going off on a science tangent today. It's science class, children. But I mean, life, in my opinion, will eventually go on in the universe somewhere because I do believe that there are people on other planets. This is a weird, this went weird. But I mean, in a way, or maybe, you know, humans will venture off before, I mean, obviously that's going to happen in thousands, if not millions of years. So eventually, I mean, humans could branch off and they could live on another planet, another Earth-like planet somewhere. And that could be, I mean, I really don't think that this was what our ancestors thought when they were telling the story of Ragnarok, like, oh yes, children, we're gonna be on another planet, another solar system. But it's it's trying to blend that science into the lore and everything, and I just went off on a huge tangent, and I promised I wouldn't, oh god damn it. Anyway, I hope that that made sense. As for the signs, that, that's the signs. We got the three, three year long winter and the brothers turning against brothers, um, cousins not holding oaths to each other anymore, and all of that. So secondly, what is your view on how the gods exist? Are they real as you and me? just have an unknown lifespan? Are they in a different reality, plane of existence? Are they the planets? Expand on that and go. <laughs> I have actually met somebody who um, said that they believed the gods were ancient aliens and that they were these, these almost like, it reminds me of the Assassin's Creed plot where you have the Isu, which are these like 
higher than human beings that are that basically inspire the myths of the gods. I tend to believe that the gods are real entities. They are separate entities from each other. Um, they are actual beings, whether they exist on another plane or another planet. No, I think there's like different planes of existence. There's different realms. The the lore talks about different realms. There's you know Asgard, Vanaheim, Elfheim. Uh, Niflheim, Midgard, but I, I'm not sure if people take that to mean there's, they're on different planes of existence or if they're like different planets. I, I know that some people like to say that they're different planets, going back to the person who said that they were aliens who made contact with humans thousands of years ago, but I tend to believe that they're different planes of existence. Like they, everything exists um, simultaneously in the same space, but almost like uh, alternate un, not alternate universe, like different planes that we can't we can't perceive but it's happening around us almost like ghosts <laughs> this is this is going somewhere really weird i tend to believe that the gods are real entities and that they exist in another realm of existence that is simultaneously happening with our realm and that they can cross in between these realms which is something that we as humans do not have the ability to do when we die perhaps our spirits which transcend physical bodies will have the ability to, to travel between realms that was one thing I had a conversation with someone years ago, not years ago, um, it was probably like last year actually, about how they wanted to explore Jotunheim when they died because they want, they're they very into uh, Rokatru um, and they wanted to do that when they died instead of, you know, being confined to hell or being confined to Folkvanger or Valhalla, they wanted to explore the realms and I think that in the lore there was actually um, evidence of that because you have you don't just have people who go to these halls you have people who go to who are in burial mounds you have people interacting with spirits in the lore and I, th I think that it's really up for debate what happens after you die and your spirit does this and whatever things and goes to different realms so yes I think that the realms and the gods exist on another plane that is simultaneously existing alongside our own but we just can't cross over into it. We may get glimpses in dreams, we may get glimpses in, um, you know, trances and stuff like that that some people are able to do, but we physically cannot go there as of right now. Does that make sense? I think I expanded pretty well on that. Do you think they are omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent? I do not. Um, in the lore, the gods are not made to be all-knowing. Odin has to go in the Voluspa and talk to a dead vulva to get more information about Ragnarok and everything that's going to go on, so he doesn't inherently know this. Um, when Baldur has his dreams, he goes back to the dead vulva and asks for clarification on these dreams because he himself does not know what it means. So the gods are not all-knowing. Um, they're not all powerful either. They have an end, they have limitations, they have flaws, which is one reason why I was particularly drawn to the gods is because they're not some untouchable beings. They are relatable. They're not, you know, omnipresent. They're not always there. And there's another thing um, that when pe I've talked to people who say, oh, I haven't had contact with the gods or I feel like the gods aren't always a around me where I can contact them like and I think that that makes sense because I feel like the gods can't necessarily be everywhere at once. They are limited beings. They're powerful beings. They're gods, obviously. But they're not like the Judeo-Christian god who is everywhere all the time. I'm all powerful. <laughs> That's really creepy. <laughs> we're not going we're not going there today. I do think that they're they have limitations and I particularly like that about them. Um, I think that a lot of people as heathens the, the main point is to focus on yourself and to take care of yourself and to learn self su self sufficiency and I think that the gods can help you with that but it's something that you have to do on your own you have to find the strength in yourself and you can also rely on the gods for some things but it comes back to you taking care of you first and foremost I hope that that makes sense there isn't really much on Skadi so what are your thoughts on her also giants there are not Vanir or Aesir, but they are still worshipped as gods. The Skadi, um, I often see her in relation to winter things, um, hunting as well. She is a giant. She was Thiazi's daughter, who Loki kind of got killed. It's a long story. <laughs> but in recompense for her father's death, she goes to Asgard and she... Um, this is a funny story about Loki as well. She goes to Asgard in recompense, and she wants the gods to, one, make her laugh, and she wants to marry one of them. Um, so when it comes to marrying one of them, she wants to marry Baldur, but 
um, they, the gods tell her that she must choose her mate, her mate, her husband, um, by only looking at their feet. So, um, she does, and she picks the most beautiful set of feet that she can, she can perceive, um, that she thinks must be Baldur, because these feet are obviously better than the rest. It turns out it's Njord. So her and Njord are married, and that's when it gets back into, in my Freya video I talked about, some people think that Skadi is Freya and Freyr's mother, in some sources it says that, and other it doesn't. So we actually don't know. There's conflicting sources. So Skadi is the the wife of Njord. Um, and when it comes to making her laugh, um, obviously Loki takes up that challenge and ties his balls to a goat and they have a tug of war. And <laughs> it just the thought of this makes me laugh. So obviously Skadi laughed and all, uh, and all was good. Although she did not like living um, with Njord. She didn't like being by the sea. So she lives in her father's old hall, um, Thiazi's hall, for part of the year and Njord lives on his own over there. When it comes to people honoring Skadi, a lot of people honor her for during the winter um, for hunting. I know people who hunt who venerate Skadi. She's kind of a very strong female figure in the pantheon, although a lot of people just kind of default to Freya when it comes to strong goddess portrayals. But definitely, Skadi is someone you don't want to mess with. She is a giant, but um, as far as I'm concerned, she is one of the Aesir. She is married to Njord. It's like the Loki debate. He's not really a god. He's accepted as one of the Aesir. Skadi is accepted as one of the Aesir. And fun story, she's actually the one who fixes the snake over Loki when he is bound. So there's some animosity between them, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, in my opinion, you don't have to be Aesir or Vanir to be venerated as a god. In my opinion, the giants are just as much godlike as the Aesir or Vanir, especially since most of the gods do have origins in the Yildnar. Um, Odin has origins in the Yildnar. So really, most things do come from them. So I think to just say that they're all together evil, and I think that's, again, a lot of something that got lost in Christianization translations, is that the giants are inherently evil. We see even in the story of Freyr, when he finds, I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but there is a giant giantess that he ends up falling in love with, and he sends his servant to go ask her to marry him. Um, she is a giant, and in the story, Freyr seems to have absolutely no problem saying, oh, she's beautiful, I want to marry her. I, I think that the demonization of the giants is actually something that was added later, was uh, a Christianization, because in my opinion, not all giants are evil. Bob Bazaar writes, I wanted to know where the younger Futhark come from and why they differ from the elder and where they were used in history. I'm currently studying the runes and have started to get into Seder, which is not what I want, but it's hard to separate the two in history. Other than Odin, what other pagans dealt with runes? I wrote notes on this because I wanted to get everything correct. So, the Elder Futhark, which has 24 runes, is the oldest of the runic uh, written alphabets. And this system was originally used by Germanic pagans for Northwest dialects. Inscriptions from this are found during the 2nd and 8th centuries, and in the late 8th century, early 9th century, it became simplified into the Younger Futhark. While in Scandinavia it became simplified, the Anglo-Saxons um, extended the Elder Futhark and it evolved into the Anglo-Saxon Futhark. So that's why you have the Anglo-Saxon, you have the, the Elder and the Younger, and there are other various runes out there, but we're going to talk about these, these three. That, that's three. The Anglo-Saxon and the Younger remained in use the longest since the early and high Middle Ages, respectively. So the Younger Futhark only has 16 characters in it, and it course, the use of this corresponds roughly to what we know as the Viking Age. Um, it began to decline after the Christianization of Scandinavia, where the Latin alphabet became the mainstream, mostly used system of writing in the area. A lot of people use the Elder Futhark today because it is easier to transliterate English into the Elder because it has the 24 characters, um, and it more readily corresponds with English. Some people think that because the um, Younger was used most commonly in the Viking Age, that that is the set of runes to use, but I'm not gonna get anal about who uses what. If, if it's easier for you to use Elder, go for it. I would recommend that you study the Younger as well, and if you want to study the Anglo-Saxon uh, Futhork, then go for it. You can always learn more. Learning's great. Really, it's up to you which one you want to use. So, I am not gonna pronounce this name right, guy. You! You! You know who you are. Uh, you say, um, believe it or not, I did post a few questions that he never showed up. That doesn't surprise me because I keep getting, I'll get, I get, like, notifications for some comments, and then when I click on them, they just go away, and I'm like, 
and I cannot find them again. And I'm like, what did you do? Eat them, YouTube? Anyway, I wanted to know how you got into the old gods, how your family and friends reacted. Um, another question that just came to me, have you ever had a paranormal experience given that you were interested in magic? If you like these questions, maybe you can answer them sometime. I'm answering them right now, hi. How I got into the old gods is an interesting question. So this was about in 2013, late 2012 possibly. I was not feeling the best. I was not in a good mental space in my life. And for whatever reason, I started to think more about religion. I was raised Christian, but I always had interest in, in witchcraft and magic and everything like that. And then I just kind of stumbled upon Norse paganism and I was like, I never, for whatever reason, I just never really thought about this as a thing before. So I started doing more research into it and it just kind of just started clicking with me. I'm like, oh, this actually sounds like something I'm interested in. And then I found Loki. And basically Loki was like, Guess what, bitches? It's learning time! Loki just kind of bitch slapped me and was like, Yeah, guess what? We're doing this now. So, um, he was my first real introduction into Norse paganism. And he helped me a lot during that time. And yes, that's why I still, I still to this day will say that he is my patron deity. Because he kind of just bitch slapped me and said, Get your hat out of your ass, we're doing this. Um, that was really how I got into it. Um, as for how my family and friends reacted, um, I haven't had much of a reaction from friends. Friends are like, that's cool. Family? Um, so far only one person knows. I'm still, um, a closet pagan, I suppose. Um, despite the fact that I have a giant altar right here. But anyway, um, no, some of my family is hardcore Christians and they're not going to like my being Norse pagan very much. So we keep this on the down low, despite the fact that I have a whole channel basically dedicated to me being a Norse pagan. <laughs> As for paranormal experiences, yes, I have had paranormal experiences. Um, the one that comes to mind the most is um, I was staying in my aunt's house um, for, we had some family event going on, but the house was built in the mid 1800s and it was actually had a historical plaque on the outside of it. It was a very old house and um, my aunt always kept telling me about how there's ghosts in this house and everything. So I spent basically the day when I was alone talking to the ghosts. I was just talking to them and then um, at night I took out my runes. And I was, I was doing some readings with my runes, and I had the door to the room I was staying in open. And I saw somebody, and it almost looked like they were wearing a white, like, nightgown dress thing, just walk past the door. And I didn't really think much of it, because I was like, okay, that's just my aunt. So I kept watching, because I didn't want her to see me using the runes. So I kept watching to wait for them to go back, and I never saw anybody go back. And, I mean, I had a full line of sight to the hallway and there was nobody there so I walked out I looked around in all the rooms nobody was upstairs went downstairs and asked nobody had come upstairs everyone was sitting around watching TV so yeah I definitely think that that was somebody who had previously lived in the house and it definitely looked like an old style white nightgown almost looking thing so that was probably the first time I'd ever actually ever seen a full-bodied apparition just fuck walk past my door. Um, and I spent time in Bachelors Grove Cemetery a lot. I have pictures of orbs and strange mists that I've captured at night. Uh, yes, I've gotten strange, I've heard strange voices when I was in bed one night. Um, I have my, it's, it's kind of almost like this where I had my bed against a wall and I heard something growl really loud right behind me. <laughs> and I was basically like, can you not? And it never happened again. And then one time I had my closet door when I used to live there. So there was like a wall and then I had my bed and then the closet door. I had made a joke that if somebody had opened this door to kill me in the middle of the night, I'd hear it because I was right next to it. Well, I was almost asleep and my closet door just slammed open against my bed, knocked over my glass of water. And I mean, it slammed with force, scared the fucking shit out of me. So I went out this way, went around the bed and I looked into the closet, nothing had fallen. If everything was where it should be, my door had just slammed open for no reason. Basically at this point I think it was just Loki fucking with me all these years because those two experiences happened when I was like 17. So yeah, I think it was basically just Loki being like, ah, you said the door would open and somebody would kill you. So I'm just gonna throw open the closet and be like, hi. So yeah, so those are a couple of paranormal experiences that I have had um, throughout my life. And there's more, but wait, there's more. Um, but this video would be way too long if I mentioned everything. So also from, I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce your name. Um, also you could explain if you will, what you think of shamanism with Odin being considered by many, myself included, a sort of sa shaman god. Um, Odin is definitely considered a shaman, shamanistic figure. Um, and there was an interesting video that a friend of mine had done. Um, he does all his videos on Facebook, so they're not on YouTube. Or he was talking about, um, not really shamanism, but, um, the vulva in particular. And while Odin is depicted as, um, sort of shaman, he, he practices satyr, 
Um, he learned Seder from Freya. Um, many people today even um, associate any men who practice Seder with um, being feminine, which is a bunch of crap. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of people who would consider a man who practices Seder to be Ergi or Arger. Um, which is a bunch of bullshit, because men can totally practice satyr. Odin did. But there are definitely stories where Odin, um, uses, uses magic. He goes into states, he travels to different realms. Um, and you also have the, the stories of berserkers who are, who are associated with Odin, um, who almost enter a sort of trance during battle that gives them ferocity that is unmatched and unparalleled, that makes them quite intimidating and fearsome to encounter in a battlefield. Um, people also say that he's, his, he has familiar spirits such as Hugin and Munin who travel the world and give him news every day, but those are sort of his familiars. You also have Geri and Treki, um, who can also be considered kind of familiars of Odin. But yes, a big part of shamanism. Shamanism, I guess, could kind of be considered like the, the, the masculine version of um, the vulva, a shaman, um, which is, could also be called a vitki. Um, that's another thing we're talking about, how the, um, the, the terms of vulva and vitki, respectively, are, a lot of people tend to throw those terms around. I, a lot, I've seen a lot of people say, oh, vulva is just the, uh, the Norse version of witch. No, uh, vulva is kind of the head, the, the, the top of the pinnacle, if you will, of, of practicing satyr. So all of these titles are not something that's just, you are. You don't just start out day one, oh yes, this is me. Um, it's something that has to be bestowed upon you. It's something that takes years, decades of work, and it's usually something that is passed down by professional practitioners who have done this their entire life. Um, it's not something you're going to become off of, you know, a video or off of a, a how-to book. It's something that really has to be taught personally by somebody who knows these ways, because they're not something that is supposed to be written down. The ways of the vulva, the ways of the vitki, are not something that is supposed to be, you know, written in the how-to book. You're supposed to learn it personally from somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, what was the question? What I think of shamanism. Um, I think that, I mean, it's definitely, a, it's, it's valid. If you want to, want to study Norse shamanism, and there's a bunch of different ways that you can determine it. If you just want to learn satyr, or you want to learn trance work or something like that. There has to be an, a, a, a balance between, oh, I'm calling myself this because, I mean, again, especially in the terms of vulva, because I see people use the word vulva a lot, and it, it kind of loses its meaning, because back in the sagas, it was something that was revered. Vulvas were somebody who, if they came to your house, they were somebody special. They were a high-ranking guest that you would really roll out the red carpet for. I think I'm going off on a rant now. But yes, practicing shamanism is not something, or practicing satyr, is not something that makes you ergi or unmanly or whatever. It's definitely a valid path for anybody who wants to practice it. And definitely in the case of Odin, it's not something that should be shied away from because you're afraid of it being unmanly. I mean, yes, in the Locusana, Loki kind of calls Odin out for it, but I mean, Odin then calls Loki out for living as a woman on Earth and bearing children. I mean, I really don't think that there's a specific way to gender magic. Really, you shouldn't shy away from it if you're afraid of being unmanly or too feminine or whatever, because you know what? Sometimes we all just need to paint our nails and drink some mead and go. I went off on a tangent on most of these things. But anyway, it's been a wild ride, and I hope, I hope that this video has been helpful in answering some of these questions. I don't know if it has, to be honest. But yes, I hope it was at least entertaining, if not informational. So, thank you all so much for watching, and if you have any additional questions, feel free to leave those in the comments below. If I didn't answer your question correctly, you know, feel free to be like, you stupid motherfucker, answer my goddamn question right. You can leave that in the comments below too. So, until next time, guys, thank you, and I will see you in the next. Goodbye!